that I, you know, do some on-air work with the program Nationwide at Five and another social media program called Timeline. Glad to be here with you. I'm joined by the Director of Communications at the Office of the Prime Minister. His name is Robert Nesta Morgan. Welcome to the pro uh, Sorry. Uh, <laughs> welcome to the forum. So used to, I'm used to just being on air, just coming off air now. Welcome to the forum, uh, Robert. How you do? Thank you for having me, Dennis. All right. Now, we're talking about the political side of social media. And having listened to uh, many of the issues raised in the previous session, uh, it shows how in terms of maintaining a social media presence, that there's a, there's a, uh, there are parallels when you're managing politicians as brands, when you're managing public figures in a different way. For instance, a lot of what we heard uh, the ladies and gentlemen raised in the previous session was about being very real on social media um, and just and putting yourself out there honestly and marketing yourself in that regard. But I, I wonder, because, and I'll get to it after, but how much of your work is presenting a very real and honest image of the people that you present or a very managed image? I think in my case, I was lucky because the politician that I worked with is somebody that was fairly new. So you had an opportunity to present to the public aspects of his life that appeals to them. Um, Initially, there was a bit of resistance from some persons on social media saying that it was fake. But then when the consistency started, like him kissing his wife, like him riding around the dam with his kids, which are things that he does all the time, mm -hmm. but people have never seen this sort of use of social media. Politicians are always thought of as these aloof people in, hidden away in castles in parliament. They never really express their personal lives. They never really open up themselves to the public. So when, when we were doing it, it was new. It was not really, probably you watch TV and see Obama do things like that, but in Jamaica, politicians were never really on social media doing that thing. All they used to send out releases and all they used to talk about government stuff, but never re really exposed the population to their personal self. They never really got people to see who they really were through social media. And what that did for us is that it built a personal connection with a lot of our followers, a lot of the people that, um, that were watching and a lot of the supporters, because now they see somebody that does things that they do, that they can identify with, that they can say, oh, you know, I like doing that. I like expressing myself in that way. I like eating that sort of food, you know, and it really appealed to the emotional consciousness of people. The challenge, though, is how do you measure traction when you, it's not like you're measuring a brand that will sell X number of units. Uh, yes, you are ultimately geared towards wanting a political outcome, but how do you, how do you assess, for instance, when you're managing a political figure, how do you assess whether or not something works or doesn't work? Whenever it doesn't work, you get the calls. <laughs> whenever, whenever you make a mistake on social media, on a politician's page, for example, the other day a mistake was made where the wrong Bible verse was, was, yes. was tweeted. Yes. And you get the call. So you know, you know when, for example, today we live streamed CARICOM. We got over four, 400 comments. We got over 6,000 views, right, on a live stream of a boring launch of a CARICOM commission. Mm -hmm. And you know when, you, when you're watching the comments and you're watching Facebook has this wonderful thing where you have an array of emotions that people can, and you know when you're doing it well that you just see the comments and the likes and all of these things just start blowing up and the negative calls don't come in. But you know when you make a mistake, people are going to call you. What is that that you posted? Again, we heard earlier, for instance, look, I cannot afford to pay attention to all the negativity. Uh, the negativity will come, etc. 
when you're dealing with a political figure, it, do you have that luxury of ignoring the negative, or do you have to consume all comments and process everything and use it to craft um, y y y your strategy? To me, it's about balance. Um, politicians, a politician's job is to not only pass laws, influence national discussions, try to modify society in a way that they think it should be modified, mm -hmm. but they also have to be popular, right? Now, in order to, we, we, our democratic process is basically the most popular politician wins. That's, that, if you, you can try to idealize it as much as you want, but elections Politics are, is a glorified popularity contest. Politics is a popularity contest. And if you are not paying attention to what your detractors are saying, then you will never have the ability to fix the things that are wrong. So I read the comments. I try to read as many of the comments as possible. The Prime Minister reads the comments. He does. Because how do you modify your policies that, so that it impacts the largest amount of people if you are not conscious of what people are thinking about what you're doing? If you're doing something that 30% of the population hates, it is your duty as a social media manager, as a politician who is interested in changing the country to understand why is it that people do not like this particular approach to, to governance? Why is it that they don't like when I wear this shirt? Why is it that they don't like whatever? You understand what I'm saying? So to me, it's a balance. I mean, there are some comments that are clearly meant to be vitriolic, clearly meant to be destructive that you're going to ignore. But many a times we post things online and people have negative reactions to it and we take it into our consciousness and we look at our strategy and we modify our strategy because maybe the negative statement is a teaching moment for us. There are some people who get the negativity regardless of what they do and this might not apply directly to you know your work but for instance there are some and I won't call any names but there are some politicians, regardless of how well they're managed, they could be, they could be putting up a, a video of themselves cooking or, or in their constituency doing something and then getting the negativity. They, they cannot do anything that will satisfy the people. I don't know if there's anybody can identify with. Sometimes you look at the comments, you look at the responses and you wonder, is everything perceived to be contrived? At what point does the politician say, look, I'm not going to look at that. I'm going to just focus on what I'm doing. It's about how you build a brand. And it's about branding. Whether or not, as I said before, you want to idealize it. It is about branding. Obama is a brand. Because in the TV era, it's about branding. If you notice, looking at American politicians coming up from the t TV started to dominate entertainment in the United States, you'll notice American, successful American politicians, the majority of them look a particular way. They're usually tall, usually... Have a good head of hair. Have a good head of yeah. hair. You know, they're usually very slim, right? And it's the, and it's the same thing in Jamaica. In Jamaica, ex, <laughs> except, yeah, in Jamaica... An interesting head of hair, okay, let me yeah, ask that. In Jamaica, you notice, and I always say to people, and people might be offended by it, but I usually say the truth, you will never see a fat prime minister in Jamaica because Jamaicans are very aesthetically conscious. If you notice all our DJs, the top DJs in our country, they look a particular way. Look at Bounty, look at Beanie, look at Alkaline, look at Vibes Cartel, they all have a particular aesthetic. So when you're a politician, you have to modify your brand in order to appeal to your... your you never have a successful prime minister with a goatee. <laughs> right. Yeah. You have to modify your brand. And a lot of the things I say to people, they might not agree with it. You can research it. You know, it's things that I've, I've looked at and it's sound. Sometimes when I say it to people, they're like, are you crazy? What did you just say? Oh, well, I got, that's foolishness. But when you look at it in depth, you'll understand where I'm coming from. So a politician has to look at their brand, not just what their putting on social media, but their brand as a whole. Because when we started out on social media with the current PM, we had to sit down and say, how is it that we're going to use social media to get our message out? And what is the message that we're going to get out to people? Initially, we were, we were bad at it. We didn't know what we were doing. Because a lot of the things we were doing 
were never done before in a Caribbean context, right? I mean, back in the day, no Jamaican politician had a significant social media presence. So there was no template to look at and say, okay, so this is how a politician should function on social media. So we made a lot of mistakes. Mm. But then we learned from those mistakes. And some politicians are gonna consistently get negative reactions, not because of what they post on social media, but because of their overall image, how they present themselves generally, how they speak in parliament, how they speak to people on the street. Because Jamaica is a very small country. And the same person that you speak to in a negative way on the street or somewhere has friends who are on social media. Mm -hmm. And when they speak negative about you on social media and other people say, oh, but I've also had a negative response from that person. It starts to snowball when other people start validating what they're saying. And those are the things we try to prevent. You have, I would imagine, have had to evolve yourself because you now are operating in a space with a tag of, Director of Communications at OPM. How has that function changed in your mind, pre, both pre and post um, acquiring that, uh, that job? I mean, before getting that post, because I never really, I wasn't one of those persons who said, okay, I'm gonna go into government and I'm gonna do this. I was pretty comfortable running my small social media business. But, when I, but I was always working with the current PM, working with his communications team, working on his social media and so on for a very long time, more, more or less as a volunteer. So when he was successful, he called and asked me if I would do the post. And I, initially I was apprehensive because I was like, I don't like wear a suit and everything. And everybody I'm going to start pre me now and all of them. You know, and, and I'm not that type of person who is going to go on a stage and make up noise. I kind of like being in the background and I recognize that this post would require some level of public recognition or would cause some level of public recognition. But what it has forced me to do is to understand the difference between political com communication and government communication because government communication is much different. Government communication, you are by default coming from a negative because in Jamaica people have a very negative perspective on government. People are people also have a negative perspective on politicians. So you're coming from behind. So when you come into government now, you have to think, okay, so government wants to push this policy forward. They want to educate the people. How am I going to message this on social media or wherever so that people will not by default, not even look at it, but they can actually click on it or make it play. And so we started doing things like live streaming. We started doing things like opening up OPM and the government to the population. We started inviting students, six farmers. I don't know if you saw Denby High School was there the other day. I saw it, yeah. Because we find that people hate government because they do not understand how government works. And by not understanding how government works, you're not able to modify government to work for you. So if you open government to people, if you allow them to see everything that is taking place, people will get an understanding of how the systems work and how they can benefit but from But there are it. so many people who view social media. They don't see the people in this room as doing serious work. They see Facebook as a place to idle. They see Twitter as a place to chat rubbish. They see, they see um, Instagram as a, as a place to model. And so how is it difficult to be open on social media, to open up government through social media, but at the same time be taken seriously by a majority of people? It's a generational thing. So if you look at the analytics of Mr. Holness's page, which has 147,000 people, you see that a majority of his fans are between the ages of 25 to 35, and they're women, right? Um, so, and if you look at social media analytics in Jamaica, we have about a million people on social media in Jamaica, you'll realize that as you go further up, it, like on, for example, on Facebook, the bulk of people on Facebook in Jamaica are between 20 and 30. Yeah, and get, Facebook is aging. Right. Mm -hmm. and, but on Snapchat, the bulk of people are between like 15 and 21. So, but the dominant social media portal in Jamaica is actually Facebook and then you have Instagram. And for our purposes, when we look at the analytics, we recognize that in, in our marketing strategy, you have to have different products 
and I hate to speak like this because it sounds very artificial. Commodification. But of, you, of, you, of you have to have different products for different demographics. So, for example, a person in Wait a Bit who is 55 is not going to, is not going to be interested in a, a, a flipper gram of Andrew Holness or whoever eating XYZ at this particular place. But somebody who is in their 20s might say, oh, this is interesting. I've been to that place. Right? So you have to, social media is not the be all and end all of your marketing and communication strategies. It's an important part of it. It's another avenue, another portal by which you can touch people. And if as a politician or as any business or any brand, you, you think that social media is going to make your business 100%, you're going to have a problem, especially in our context where internet penetration is not as good as it should be. So a lot of people still depend on TVJ for their news. A lot of people still depend on Nationwide for their news. Some people cannot afford a data plan. You know? So it's not just about social media. So yes, there are people who are apprehensive about the strategy. People internal to the politics, people external to the politics. Mm -hmm. so, but you have to find different ways of appealing to those people, both internal and externally. Before we take some questions, I, I want to go back to February. Um, because there was a clear, decisive, and aggressive uh, social media campaign. Uh, many people would say that wholeness et al. won the social media campaign. And if social media was a constituency, you'd have done very well there. Is, it, did you treat social media as a, almost like a political constituency? Or is it not monolithic enough for you to treat it like that? We did, in the sense that the, because of who the person you were promoting is and what his interests were, he's very interested in social media. He posts on his own page, he runs his own Twitter account, he posts on his own, on his own um, Instagram. When we do not post on his Facebook page, we will get a call. How come no post no go up today? <laughs> you know? And people don't... Are you not afraid that people see that as him being vain or... No, but it, it, when in conversations with him, he will say, Jamaicans are on social media, so I have to be there as well because I have to connect with the people I'm trying to lead. Right? So it... In, during the election campaign, we had to come up with a strategy to appeal to... Because a lot of our ads didn't even make it to TV because we didn't have the money, right? I mean, there were, there were ads that have over 100,000 views on Facebook alone that we could not afford to put on TV, right? And there was also an organic following on social media that we never had the money to hire all these social media managers to manage all these portals. So it was more organic where people saw him, saw the organization, liked what they were saying, and started promoting it. And we had to give, give specific attention. So we had, in our campaign, we had ads that were only meant for social media versus ads that were only which, meant for which, TV. Which raises another issue of, in terms of funding advertising campaigns, social media is so much more of an important space because, and you have to think about now, not just TV, radio, but also boosting particular posts, spending some good money to, to, to be positioned in a particular way online. I think what social media has done is equalized the, the political landscape. Mm. So back in the day, if you wanted your message out, you had to go to either a TV station, a radio station, or a newspaper. Currently, if I want a message out tonight, I can go home, shoot a video of the message, put it on a page, boost it for $20, and I can reach 30,000 people. When I, when I put an ad on TV, I have no guarantee who is watching my ad. On social media, I can tell you where the person lives. I can tell you how old they are. I can tell you what are their interests, right? And what social media has done is that it has made political parties honest. Because mm. everybody can look for that CVM TV clip. Everybody can look for that TVJ clip and post it up and say, remember when they said this, mm. right? So what we've, we've had to do is 
really look at social media as a, a movement in and of itself where young people are coming on social media, not necessarily because they love JLP or they love PNP, but because they are interested in what is going on and because they want better for the country. You understand? And we have to respect them in our activities. We have to respect them for that, not see them as people who are just interested in a political organization. Because I can guarantee that if we fail, the same people who were pushing us in February are going to be burning us out in a couple of years' time. Right, so let's see if we can take some questions. Is there anybody interested in um, getting into the mind of Robert Nesta Morgan or getting a behind the scenes look at what happens at OPM? Anybody interested nobody, or? Huh? Nobody, wants to ask nobody wants to ask any questions. It must be that this was such an incredibly boring conversation or it was so insightful. I'm going to be inclined to be biased and think it was so insightful that we didn't need to answer any questions. But look, thank you very much for, do we? Good night again. Blessings. Um, Manin Marsh, CEO of TheVinus.com. Um, question, outside of the, you know, the fluff and the engagement pieces, and they, they let people be able to connect to politicians and learn more about politicians personally, um, when you are, how does social media help to push forward um, specific political agendas? And like, it, how have you been effectively been able to get um, impact people and, and get successful political agendas out through the use of social media? Thank you for that question. Um, we have to pay attention to what people are saying. And the easiest way now to pay attention to what people are saying is to listen to their conversations on Twitter, on Facebook, and on Instagram. So on occasion, we have asked questions. And so for example, one of the first questions we asked after the JLP lost the election in 2011 is what, are, what do you think is the problem with the JLP? Right? And we had over 500 comments and we did a content analysis of those comments and there were five words that came out. Vision, focus, forwards. Vision, focus, build, connect. People said that the party lacked focus, the party needed a vision, it needs to build on what it, its achievements and it needs to connect with people. And if you go to Belmont Road right now in the main conference room, you'd see a big banner in the background and on it is vision, focus, build, connect, right? And we, we consistently do things like that because who are the people that are going to be determining the government for the next election and, and, and after? It's the people who are now 15, 16, 17. It's the young people, and the young people are on social media. So a lot of what you hear coming out of the Prime Minister's mouth on many occasions are ideas that young people who are on social media push towards him, or questions that are asked on social media and the responses that come to him. So yes, it, is a, it plays a big part in some of the policies, especially policies that have to do with young people. Okay. Thank you. Hi, uh, Jereen Patmore. You raise an interesting point with regards to young people. And right now in political marketing, there is a big, I won't even say that, there is a big um, talk with regards to the JLP's campaign and the recent elections. However, we saw that a lot of young people did register to vote. But when we were looking at the figures, young people didn't actually vote. So whereas you may have won the social media campaign, how do you translate that into the real underground politics? I wouldn't say young people didn't vote. I oh, mean, no, the stats say that. I'm not saying no, that. <laughs> part, of the thing, part of the thing you have to re realize is that there are, hundreds, there are thousands of people on the voters list who are dead, right? And when I hear people say, oh, less than... Oh, no, I'm not talking about the persons. All right, let me make that clear. The stats are showing that the number of persons that voted mm -hmm. are the people on the voters list. The persons that voted, they aren't in the demographics that we consider social media marketers to be the key demographics. So we're looking at people between the ages of 18 to 25, and in terms of Facebook, it'll be more 25 to 30, somewhere around there. It depends on your demographics. But you know, what you point to is a fact that many political analysts have always identified that young people talk a good talk, 
well, but when it comes vote. to election day they do not go out and vote yes. and so many the... and many politicians say i'm not putting my faith in the young people the young people will talk me into thinking that i'm going to win and they will not turn up and i've always said this and i think in an interview before the election i asked robert i said you guys are focusing so much on social media you guys may just flop because social media the young people who are tweeting away they will tweet and tweet and tweet and on election day use a million different hashtags and then be like, yeah, I don't feel like going out, though. Yeah, so, um, so also you brought us a good point. The margin, which was won, it's not significant. So how do we know that political social media marketing, how do we get that to translate into actual action? Hmm. So how do you build that from basic engagement and numbers into on-the-ground action? I don't want to say real world. Social I, media is real. I don't view, I don't view social media as about votes, just about votes. Because if you start looking at social media as a place to go and win votes, then you, you're making a big, big mistake. For me, I view it more holistically because politics is about ideas. And, it's a, and the best ideas and the best selling of ideas wins the day, right? So the JLP's idea in the last election was Prosperity, right? Which seems to have captured a large, larger amount of people than the ideas of the other side. If you look at it just from how can we use, young people did not vote, so then they did not impact the political process. It's kind of, it's kind of uh, I, would, I don't want to say flawed logic, because that would be not, Correct. It's kind of difficult to look at it like that because the ideas that come from young people impact the entire society. And when you're interacting with young people on social media and you're getting, you have a pool of ideas about how they want to see their country and you take those ideas and you put them in a particular form and you start pushing them out, they start to resonate among the wider population. As it relates to how do you use that for the grassroots? The Prime Minister said something that got him in trouble on Twitter, or he said it on, on TV and people on Twitter cussed him, that you need to put down your phones and walk to the polling station. And it's something that we genuinely believe in because young people all the time complain about not being counted, right? And I'm an example of being counted because I'm not supposed to really be where I am. Most of the people who are in my office before me are in their 50s and 60s. I'm 34 years of age. How is it that I could reach this position because I stood up and said, yo, I want to be counted. And I find that our team is a very young team. Most of the people in my team or the team that works with us are below my age group. So when you say young people are not doing stuff, they are doing stuff, but not, not to the extent. You measure, it by, you measure it by outcomes and impact. A lot of the persons who assisted with our campaign, maybe some of them didn't vote, but they contributed to our success. They contributed by giving us ideas, they contributed by going into communities and talking to people. They contributed by influencing other persons to vote. Right? And I know a lot of people who on social media, when, when um, election day come, a lot of people I did not, who, who, were, never in, who were never enumerated, got enumerated and on election day you saw them putting up them finger with the yeah, dick. Yeah, yeah. I was know, about to was say that that was thing. an interesting social media trend that was actually on election thing. day. So know. while the statistics might be saying, oh, as much young people as we expect to vote didn't vote, we did see an increase in the amount of young people that we expected to come out. You know? I, was, I would promise somebody I wouldn't say, you know, so I will not say it again. Hi, good evening, everyone. Now, for well, Robert Nesto, Morgan, you are currently invited into your role that you have now. What are the strategies or some of the things that you believed pushed you in this position to be invited for into such a platform? Hard work. <laughs> it's hard work. I mean, we spent, because I was in the private sector, um, I was overseas and I came back in 2011 
and I decided, listen, I'm, I believe in this person. I'm going to try to use my expertise and my knowledge to help this person to reach where they reach. And there were a lot of sleepless nights, a lot of 3 a.m.s. Um, there's a gas station and Don Robin that knows me very well, coming to buy a monster, you know. Um, but other than that, we had to also, I had to also look at the best practices. And I always say to my people who work with me that there's nothing original under the sun, right? So you have to look at what is Obama doing? What is Cameron doing? What is Justin Trudeau doing? You know, what are they doing in these first world countries to make their social media appeal to people? And I looked at what these people are doing and I tried to modify it to Jamaican context. And the other thing I had to do as well is I had to learn how to shoot, I had to learn how to edit, I had to learn how to take pictures, I had to learn how to do Photoshop. Because if you're going to be a well-rounded social media person, you have and to... And your wholeness it. being photoshopped. <clears throat> I heard that, yeah. Go ahead, go ahead, continue. We, we cut off him belly. Oh. <laughs> yeah. If you, if, you, if you want to be successful at social media, you have to understand the tools that social media people use. I mean, I always say to people, I will never hire somebody for a job that I don't know how to do or even have an understanding of how to do it. Because how are you going to manage somebody? that you don't have an understanding of what they're doing. So I had to learn how to shoot videos. I had to learn how to edit videos. And building that intellectual capacity and applying it and bringing in the, the best people that we could find actually, I think, probably encourage people to have confidence in what I do. Thank you very much, everyone, for your participation. We're going to leave it there and uh, hand over to Corv de Costa, who is going to introduce the next session. Thank you, Robert Morgan, and thank you, Dennis Brooks. An applause, please.